Hey, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I was looking at who else was going to be talking at the same time that I was, and I saw that the dude that created Lodash was talking, and I was like, there's nobody that's going to come to my talk. Like, come on, that guy's awesome. So I'm humbled that there's so many people in here. So you guys must all be suffering from kind of the same problems that I've suffered through, which is needing to rebuild something. Um, how many of you in here write code on a daily basis? Okay, how many of you are like designer or product or you don't write code on a daily basis? Okay, how many of you are not going to raise your hand no matter what? <laughs> There's a few people I was looking for that never raised their hand. That's all good. Um, okay, so a little bit about me. Um, I started building websites when I was uh, like 12 or so, somewhere around 1996. Um, if you write JavaScript, uh, the tilde is actually an operator, but we're not going to look at any code today. So just assume that that tilde means about 1996. Um, I went to college for five years and uh, dropped out to pursue technology. Uh, so far, it's paid off. So that's been uh, cool. But I'm not a computer science background guy. So if you are, you can look down on me, and that's OK. Um, I'm an engineer at Envision App. Uh, a lot of you guys, if you deal with product teams at all, uh, you probably have heard of us or use our app or whatever at some point to, uh, you know, we're kind of like a design collaboration tool. I've lived all over the United States. Most recently, I was in San Francisco working in for startups in Silicon Valley. It's awesome out there. If you throw a rock, you're probably going to hit an engineer or a homeless person, one of the two. Uh, don't throw rocks. But... Uh, it was an awesome experience. Uh, we, you know, I made a ton of money out there, and that means my landlord made all of the money that I made. Uh, so I came back to Oklahoma, where I'm from originally, so that I could you know, kind of keep some of what I'm making. Um, and I love winning and human interaction. And those two are, they kind of go hand in hand. I also have a family. I'm married. I got kids. I love them too. But that wouldn't, you know, I ran out of space because my arm was right there. So... <laughs> Uh, but winning and human interaction are two things that are going to kind of uh, flow through this. So that's why I called those two things out specifically. Um, okay, let's talk really quick about the problem. And I would imagine that if you saw the title of this, if you read through kind of what this talk is about, you may be experiencing one or more of these problems. That looks a lot worse up there than it does on my screen. Uh, but that is a big mess of junk over there. So that is what that's supposed to look like. So let's talk about a couple of the problems you may be experiencing. You're kind of looking at your application, where it's at right now, and you probably are using jQuery. How many of you are using jQuery in your app today? Okay, so most of you, all right. So you're probably seeing these problems. That's good. Uh, jQuery is a great library. I, I like it. Uh, at some point, you're probably saying, oh my gosh, we messed up something. Or you may be saying, this thing that we have right now, we cannot use this anymore. Uh, we need new things, uh, and this isn't just not working for us anymore. You may be saying, everything is broken all the time. You may be saying, I have no idea what the problem is, but it's there. There is a problem. And I just want to welcome you to the club. That's a background photo that looks really nice on my screen. So just bear with me there. So what we're going to do is I'm going to kind of, I'm not going to go through any code because it wouldn't do us any good to go through code because you guys don't all use Angular or Ember or Backbone or React. It looks like a lot of you use jQuery, but we're not going to talk about specific code. We're going to talk about some principles that you can apply that uh, I think at the end of this, I'm going to give you like five or six kind of takeaways that you can apply starting now to kind of get you to where you're trying to go to. All right, so we're going to look at three different stories. These are three companies that I've worked for. Uh, I don't want to call them out by name because uh, I don't want to get in trouble. They're putting this online. Uh, so we're going to call these companies uh, Secure Cloud Corp. We're going to call them Adco and Megacorp. Um, and these, uh, the, I'll talk a little bit about them as I, as I kind of go into them. But one of the, uh, one of the things I want to kind of mention before I get started on these is there are some things that are in common with all of them. And maybe you have all of these things in common as well, or maybe you have some of these things in common. So all of them were using jQuery, or had started out at some point were, were using jQuery. Uh, they all had multiple environments. So they had like a, a local dev environment. They had a QA staging environment. And they also had their production environment. Some of them had more than others. 
uh, and some of those were more shoddy than others. Uh, they were all using JIRA or some kind of project management tool. I think these just happen to all be using JIRA. Uh, all of them were using Git. Uh, they all wanted a new or better dashboard. And I'm curious in this region, how many of you guys are in a company where you guys are trying to build a new version or wanting to build a new version of your dashboard? A few of you, okay, all right, <laughs> he's laughing. All right, there we go. We're, we're making some, some uh, relationships here. Um, and all of them at some point eventually got to using some form of a RESTful JSON API. All right, so those are some of the things that are in common with all of them. So if you're kind of curious about some of the tech stack stuff, I can talk about those in detail um, with a, I'll give you plenty of time for questions and answers and all that stuff later. All right, so let's talk about Secure Cloud Corp. All right, so one of, uh, here's, here's kind of where they were. This is what they, what they had. They were uh, a rail shop. I was the first front end engineer that they hired. Um, and they had tons of testing. If you are in the Rails, uh, if you have like a Rails environment or whatever, you know that testing is like paramount to what you do on a daily basis. So they had a ton of tests. They had a, a lot of uh, uh, functional tests, integration tests, unit tests, and everything um, on the server side had a lot of tests. On the client side, they were just using jQuery, vanilla JavaScript. Uh, they were using the asset pipeline. If you're not familiar with that, it's basically like they had a way to kind of require all these different files and then you know, those files got concatenated and minified on the, on the production environment, but locally it you know, allowed you to not have to you know, look at this big massive thing. So they had a mostly, in, uh, mostly stable environment. They, they weren't really running into problems of like, oh my gosh, this thing's just breaking every single day. What they were running into was more performance issues and trying to, to reuse code, there was none of that. No, no code reusability from the client side. Most of that I think had to do with, they were not really JavaScript people, they were Rails people, and they were just, you know, they had to make JavaScript work. Um, and everything was automated. They did, I mean, I, I still kind of base a lot of the things that I do around automation based on what they did. So, so they were, uh, they had like a solid release schedule, but they had some, uh, they had some needs. They wanted this new design for this dashboard that they'd put together. They, uh, they wanted the design to be completely decoupled from the code, like from the actual logic. So how many of you are, uh, how many of you kind of understand what that means? Like you, maybe you have a design, like somebody says, we want to change the design of this site. And you say, if we do that, we're going to break everything. How many of you guys are in that boat right now? I see hands and smiles, so I feel you. All right, so they wanted this design completely decoupled from the application logic. And they initially, they were like, hey, look, we're going to hire a front-end guy. We're going to bring him in. Forget the fact that we have five other engineers that are moving forward on our already cash, cow, you know, cash flowing application. We're going to hire one guy, and he's going to go into a closet for 12 months and build us this <laughs> massive thing, and it's going to magically replace all the functionality of our current thing that's broken. Uh, that didn't go so well. Um, and they, they wanted the ability to unit test the client side code. They wanted to be able to test the client side code, right? Um, they also needed to be able to reuse a lot of the code. So they were finding that they were running into the same, uh, if you remember from, from uh, the keynote this morning, they were kind of talking about there's like a fundamental problem that you're trying to solve. And it, regardless of like what that problem is, you're, you're trying to like do something to solve a, a problem. And you see, like, you've heard the expression, um, if you know how to use a hammer, like, you know, I actually am butchering this, this problem. Everything looks like a nail if you know how to use a hammer, if you only have a hammer or something like that. I don't know what that is. Anyway, if you, if you have a hammer and you only know how to use that hammer, you're going to be hammering everything, right? So if you, if you could just kind of imagine every single time we would see a problem, we would try to solve that problem and then we would see that same problem over here and we would have to resolve that problem all over again because we couldn't use this. And then we'd see that same problem, the same paradigm, it was in a different module, a different section of the site, but we're continuously fixing the same problem over and over again. So we kept having these patterns. <clears throat> the other thing is that they needed 
the new features of this new dashboard to be able to solve or simplify what customers were doing. So it wasn't like they were losing money or anything, but they really, really wanted to be able to move forward. And they were having a really hard time moving forward because the dashboard was just not allowing them to do that. They could not add features fast enough. They could not add them in a way that they felt confident pushing it out. So they ran into those problems. Does anybody, does anybody relate to any of those? Does that sound like, eh, that might be kind of where we're at. Hey, there we go. You might have problems with your camera sometimes. <laughs> All right, so, so what we, here's basically what we did, all right? So at first, remember, they said, let's do this all at once. We uh, implemented Backbone. Uh, we did have a, a, a great integration with the API, so there was no problems with the technology. We didn't have any technology problems. But what we eventually discovered was that I could not write code fast enough to keep up with the other five engineers that were still moving forward again, on the application that's already making money. So it kind of got into this like, well, Brian, we really you know, wish you could move faster. And I was like, I really wish I could too, but I only have two hands. And so I've got two laptops, but you know, this doesn't work. <laughs> uh, product, actually, I, I, I kind of had this idea. I was like, look, what if, you know, we've got this brand new design and a lot of the modules are still the same. What if we took this new header, just because the top of the side is changing dramatically. What if we just took that header and we put it on our legacy app? Just that one module, because I, I, I'm looking at the code and I can actually rewrite that in like two days. Products, no, 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 no. We need everything at once. You, it's just not gonna work if you have one piece and then you know, not the rest of everything else. So I was like, okay, okay, I got it. And so I went home and did it anyway. Um, and that's how I do everything, so I'm a bad kid. But uh, I came back a couple days later, and I was like, hey, hey, Mr. Product Guy, don't want to call him out by name. Uh, he actually ended up leaving the company eventually, he went to Box, and now he's rich because Box went public. Go figure. I hate that guy. Anyway, no, he was, he was a good guy. But I am jealous. He's got a lot of money now. Um, so I went, I went to him a couple days later, and I said, I said, hey, I just want to show this to you. I just want to show you what this would look like. Once he saw it, he's like, okay, we've got to do this. We've got to implement this. It doesn't matter if everything else doesn't fit together. We've got to have this new header because that's perfect. And so I kind of got this idea, you know, maybe we should try to just iteratively add like one feature at a time. And we kind of built this like kind of a, a, a solid foundation, if you will. And we started, it was just kind of in parallel with our existing code, our legacy code. And then we started adding those features kind of to the legacy app, but kind of through this foundation, if you will. That's going to, I'll, I'll kind of wrap that up later What that really looks like. But by building a solid foundation and then implementing a feature at a time and just iterating and taking what's already, what's already live and just changing out a few pieces at a time, we were able to deliver value quickly. So the conversation completely switched from, Brian, you've been working on this for six months and you've got nothing to show for it, which, I mean, of course, I can't build an entire app in six months if it's you know been built over three years by five people. But it switched from, like, Brian, you're not really going very fast, to, hey, what else can we launch this next week, this next release that we're about to have? What else can we get out there? What other features can we add? So our perspective changed from, let's redo this whole thing, to let's see what we can add value to now that will improve and get us to where we want to go in the future. Which, by the way, here's like a guru prediction for you. If you have a direction you want to go to in the future, it's probably, that's probably not exactly where you're going to end up. Uh, you're probably going to go towards it, and you're going to diverge because customers are going to want you to go this way, uh, products going to want you to go this way, market trends are going to change, whatever. So it's great to have this idea of like this is where we want to go, but if you can just take steps towards that, then when that changes, that's okay. That's kind of like being agile. Um, I'm not a big fan of like calling agile development uh, a thing because agile just is a word. It just means like to be able to change directions quickly. If you think about Emmett Smith and Barry Sanders, what were those guys really good at? Hopefully you guys know, they're football players. You guys know, okay. Some, some tech conferences you go to, they don't know, right? But you guys are smart, you guys are football fans. We're in Oklahoma, right? All right, so those guys were very agile. They could change directions quickly. And that's what I believe you gotta be able to do in software, right? So when we talk about agile development, when I hear that term, I think that means we need to be able to change directions quickly if we need to. And a lot of times you need to. Okay, so that was, uh, that was Secure 
Cloud Corp. Let's look at ADCO. All right, so ADCO was a little different. They were in the process of designing a new dashboard. Okay, so maybe they weren't so different. Uh, they needed most of the features of their new dashboard to meet the customer needs now. Okay, so maybe that's exactly the same as the other company. All right, now here's one thing that was different. They were not very stable, and the performance of this app was getting to the point where it was not usable. Like it was, it was like, you know, one month we were able to pull 15 days worth of data. Right, for over, over like the past 30 days, I can pull 15 days. If I pull any more than 15 days, it's gonna crash the site, right? A couple weeks later, I can pull 13 days. A couple weeks later, I'm down to nine. So we were able to kind of watch this, like we are gonna get to a point where we cannot even pull data from our application because it's just going to crash. So that was a, that was a problem. There was no code reusability. Uh, this was a full stack JavaScript environment. This is my first time getting to work in Node.js in a production environment, so I, liked, I loved it. That was a lot of fun for me. Um, everything on the client side was jQuery, and everything was inline JavaScript, meaning there was no like main.js. There was no, I mean, we did have jQuery.js, <laughs> but, but there was no like, hey, here's our application. It was all literally embedded in the HTML. Don't raise your hand. How many of you guys? <laughs> Okay, don't raise your hand. <laughs> All right, so very, very few external files. Most of those were like libraries, basically. So they kind of built their own prison in a way. Um, no reusability, no automation. I mean, yeah, they had a deploy process, kind of, but it was like controlled by a guy and whatever. Uh, bright guy, I like him. Um, but the, there, was, there was, again, no reusability. There was no way to test. Has anybody in here ever successfully tested JavaScript, like ran a unit test or Jasmine test or something on JavaScript that is written inside of an HTML file. I've never had anybody raise their hand on that. You have? No, you didn't. You did? Really? Well, show me. <laughs> I, want to, I want to know because I've got some problems I've got to fix now. So if you, if you know how to do it, please show me. Uh, yes, yes. But can you say like, okay, this particular function that's embedded inside of the HTML file, I wanna test that method? You've gotten that to work? If you, I mean, I, I don't know, if you have. Yeah, I think we've done that with, uh, if we use browser apply to bundle everything into a single JS file, so I guess it's external, but it's loaded into the HTML in a script tag. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yes. That's, that's the way to do it. But to, to actually have like the code it's written. Like yeah. Okay, okay, cool. All right, you scared me. I'm sweating up here. I'm like, oh, shoot, you figured it out. <laughs> like, man. All right. Okay, yes. And in fact, uh, the, those technologies you just mentioned, those are some of my favorite. Uh, I found those to be uh, the most success I've had with testing has been using Browserify or Webpack. I know some people like Webpack. Uh, Karma is, is like the test runner environment or whatever. That's, again, tech stack we can talk about later. Um, Okay, so they needed the code reusability, they needed tests, and we needed the performance stuff. And again, we are like ticking time bomb, watching every single week, we're getting worse and worse, closer to this like point of no return. And again, I was the first front end guy that they hired. Hey, we want you to go off into this room for 12 months and build us this big thing that's gonna replace what these eight engineers have made. Um, it did not go very well. So, here's what we did started writing it all at once. We had, uh, I wrote everything from scratch, even the node server, I mean, I, I took everything, it was beautiful, oh my gosh, it was beautiful code, excellent code. And it was like, I mean, I, I, had, I had, I mean, I was best practices you could ever have, but zero progress, meaning from a business perspective, like yeah, I wrote a ton of code, and yeah, it's awesome, and I could open source it all, and you guys would be like, oh my gosh, this is amazing, probably not, but, <laughs> The, from a business perspective, let's, let's be real, that's what matters. And there was zero progress, zero value added to the company. So when business people start looking at, ah, what are we doing on this project? They're wondering how much revenue are you bringing in? That, if you didn't know that, that's what business people are looking at. Um, <laughs> at least that's what I think they're looking at. Um, so eventually what we started doing is we started creating these micro tools. So we, we started, I, I, I basically sat down with the people 
internally who were using our app. And I said, show me what you do on a daily basis. Show me what is so hard with our application. Show me what it is because I can't deliver you something next week you know, that's gonna be a, a full replacement, which is what I was working on. I can't do that in a week, but you guys are running out of time and I'm gonna help you now. And they said, well, here's this one thing. And you know, we basically have this process that takes you know, 40 hours of, of my time a week to do it when I should be doing, spending my time doing something else. So I was able to identify some small areas where I could go in and refactor some of the existing code, add some tests to it, add some, add some, uh, uh, some consistency to some of the things so other people could come in and look at it and work on it. And we were able to deliver value immediately. In fact, one of the tools that I built, this was like two weeks after I started at this company. I'm sorry, two months after I started at this company. Uh, one of those tools they're still using today. And I've been gone for, I don't know, this, is, this had to have been almost two years ago, coming up on two years ago. They're still using that tool today, and it's nothing groundbreaking. It was just, let's add a little bit of value. So we started, re, uh, we started rewriting pieces at a time, started taking small chunks, completely rewriting it. Again, having that solid foundation, we built that foundation, we were able to test with it, and we were able to go through that foundation and into this legacy app, replacing some of the code that wasn't working very well. And that was awesome. That completely changed how product, it, it, in fact, it completely shifted how product was looking at this new application. And like I, like I said before, we kind of had this idea of like where we want to go, but by the time we realized like, you know what, this project is just, it's not gonna get off the ground. The market was already shifting somewhere else. So whenever we had kind of taken a step back and started rewriting pieces at a time, we were able to also, at the same time, focus on what's the most important thing right now. Let's make the, the most important thing the most important thing. Let's focus on it. Let's add value. So that was a huge success. Now, one other thing I want to throw out there, uh, we also used Backbone there, and then we started using React.js. React is awesome if you have not had a chance to play with it. Play with it a little bit. Even if you never use it, just it makes you think about things a little different. So um, I am a big fan. All right, so let's talk about the last one. This was Megacorp. I swear this guy worked for him. I looked, okay. <laughs> in, on the server side, .NET, we had some, we had some Java. In the services that were written in Java, it was kind of like we had the, basically the web server was .NET, and then we had these backend services that were in Java. And there were some tests written around there. Um, and the .NET side, I don't think there was any tests. On the client side, no way. Who has heard, especially if you're from Oklahoma, who's heard of Snowflake, the Snowflake library? So if you have not heard of Snowflake, it's a library that basically, like there's no way that your problem has ever been solved by somebody else. There's no way. So just rewrite it, you know, write your own library because nobody's ever solved the problems that you're solving, right? Um, you, should, you should go look up Snowflake on GitHub. It's pretty funny. And it's kind of, it's, obviously it's a satire thing, but um, you guys aren't laughing, so <laughs> Sorry, there we go. Thanks, that was a mercy laugh. Um, but we basically had said, hey, this, th let me give you a couple of, of instances, because some of you I'm sure have ran into this before. Yes, I see that we have access to libraries like underscore and lodash, but let's go ahead and create our own library that does exactly what those do. Anybody seen, anybody had that happen before? Anybody done that before? Don't raise your hand. All right. Uh, we had, we did have jQuery, uh, but we did not use jQuery's Ajax functionality. We wrote our own Ajax functionality. Anybody ever done that before? I haven't done that since jQuery came out. So since I discovered jQuery, I've never done that. So I was a little surprised. And like I said, I think this guy was the one who was actually working for him. But um, we had 12,000 line JavaScript files. Don't raise your hand if you have those either. Uh, those were obviously really messy. But they did a good job of keeping everything out of the DOM, at least. They didn't have any code you know, mixed in with the HTML. So that was cool. Um, uh, but again, no stability. And that was because we were using Snowflake JS. We had no testing. Everything was broken all the time. Every single change, if something worked and then we added a new feature to something that was completely unrelated, that would break this thing and this thing and we'd fix this and that would break five other things. Who's there right now? 
You're there right now? Okay. People don't want to raise their hand, but I'm sure everybody wants to. All right. We did have some reusability, and I say laughable automation, because it was kind of automation, but if you looked at it, you'd laugh. So that's why I call it <laughs> laughable automation. All right. So basically, one guy knew everything. This was another problem. When one person knows everything it's about you know, one part of the application, man, you become really dependent on that guy. You better hope he knows what he's doing. But that, that is actually, that was one of the problems that we ran into there. Um, and we had an incredibly slow release schedule. So it was kind of like things, we weren't really adding value quickly. We were just kind of adding value over time, like over six months. Like in, within six months, we'll make a release. But that one release would break five other things. So it was just really, really frustrating. So performance of the legacy app was already unusable. It, it wasn't like it's a ticking time bomb. Like we were already there. We couldn't, nobody could use it. There were, we were not able to close deals because people would look at our product and say, I, I, we can't use this. So what, what is the purpose of this application? Uh, product is obviously very, very upset about that. Um, they, uh, they needed code stability. And we also, uh, they wanted everything completely scrapped and rewritten, but they actually didn't want to redo everything at once. They actually did want to take an iterative approach. Mm -hmm. So in the very beginning, I had that support, which was awesome. All right, so how we went about rewriting this application. We basically agree, like I just said, to we're gonna do this incrementally. We're gonna start adding value today. So we built a foundation, again, that solid foundation. And we implemented testing immediately, right out of the gate. So we're gonna be able to, we're gonna build everything so that it can be tested. We're gonna write tests with everything. Now, did we have 100% code coverage? No. Do I think you should have 100% code coverage? No, that doesn't make sense. But we had the ability to test. And if you don't have the ability to test your code, try it. Try to get someplace where you can. You may just find that you actually enjoy your job a little bit more. So uh, we basically built one feature one component, this was a new component, we weren't rewriting something, but we added this one new component, right? We added it to the application, and then we tested it, made sure it worked, it, it worked like we expected it to, and we released it. Went out to the wild, people got to look at it, oh, this is great. Okay, now we have another thing that's very similar to this. So I kind of looked at, can we reuse any of this code? Maybe a few things, but let's go ahead and create another thing. We're going to create this second module. And we're, we'll reuse what we can, but we're not really going to focus on trying to reuse that. So we launched this second module. It, everybody loved it. Okay, this is great. This is performant. This is whatever. And then we said, okay, now let's take a second and let's kind of evaluate where we're at. Let's see if we can refactor some of these things since we've got some logic that's being used, you know, being rewritten twice. Let's refactor. So we basically took the time to refactor, we took the time to reiterate, rethink, but it was in the midst of releasing value, adding value to the product. And that was success. Uh, that was successful. One of the other things that we did um, was that we enforced code review on all the new stuff so that I wasn't the only one writing the new stuff and then putting it out there. Um, also at the the second company I'm talking, um, this is the third company I'm talking about. The second company, we also did the same thing. We were able to, uh, I forgot to mention that. We were able to share the knowledge about the new stuff we were building amongst the small team. So there wasn't just one person that knew about it. And this project now, back to Megacorp, whenever we were uh, building these new features, we were enforcing code reviews. In fact, I mean, I'm the only guy that's writing the, the code for the new stuff, but I've got another guy on the team. I said, look, you have to code review every one of my things. You have to look at every one of my pull requests and you have to merge it in. I'm not gonna merge it in. You have to do this. And I forced somebody else to look at it so that the knowledge was spread out. All right, so these were, were some, just kind of summarizing this a little bit. Everybody wanted this new design decoupled, right? They wanted it completely decoupled from the application. They all wanted better performance. They all wanted all these new things yesterday. They all needed this yesterday. Uh, they all needed their internal tooling issues that they had. They needed those issues fixed. And they also needed confidence 
and their client-side code. Do you remember my talk about client-side confidence? Patrick's from Tulsa. He's a great guy. So you guys haven't met him, buy him a beer or something tonight. Um, okay, so these were, were some of the common needs that were identified. Does anybody relate to any of those or some of those? Who is not willing to raise their hand at this point? Okay, great. You all kept your hands down, so that means you are willing to raise your hand. Good. All right, so what fixed it? All right, here are six things. This, these are the six things that I believe you need to take away from this talk that I think you can implement now. These are the six things that made every one of these projects eventually successful. And it's in one slide. I'm not going to bore you with a ton of slides. We built a basic and organized new foundation. Okay? This foundation coexisted with the legacy application. Now, it'd be really difficult to sit here and tell you, here's how you do that. Because it can, it, there's, I don't know what everybody's, everybody's probably got Snowflake JS in their code somewhere. So it would be very difficult to say, well, this is how you do that. I will tell you it is possible, right? It is possible to do this. You just have to think how to do it. We added value one feature at a time. That is, it, I'm putting my business hat on, which is a very small hat. It's more like a, what's the yarmulke? What is that? It's more like a yarmulke. All right. Putting my business hat on, business people would probably really appreciate if you added value immediately, right? And if you could add value every single week, business people would probably appreciate that. I believe they do. But when we started doing that in every one of these projects, it was successful every single time. We evaluated and iterated over time, meaning we didn't try to just, there's where we want to go, we're full steam ahead. Like, no, we, we took a step, added value, and then looked back, <coughs> reflected on it. Is this, is this working? Yes. Okay, let's add this thing. All right, are these two working? Wait, these are the same thing. Let's group these together. All right, cool. Now we've got some new tools that we can use for the future. We didn't try to build the tools we need in the future. We, we built those tools when we needed them. Somebody else did a talk earlier about that. I think that was in the keynote, actually. And then we distributed the knowledge. One, that very first project I told you about, it was a successful project. But the downside was, whenever I left, I was the only one that had, had been working on it. Now, other people had been doing code reviews, but they were basically just looking at, like, is this going to mess up with any of the Rails stuff? And if it didn't touch the Rails stuff, they didn't care. Just, OK, accept it. Right? If it passed the test, they're good. But when we had distributed knowledge about the code that we were adding, and when multiple people knew what was going on in that code, it made it so much easier to be able to move forward on things. And it also made it easier to get code reviews because people had, you know, if I, if I give you this massive, you know, here's 12,000 lines of code for a code review, here's my first pull request with this big thing I've been working on, who here has ever done one of those kind of code reviews and actually gone line by line? Probably not. Well, if you have, great. <laughs> but I know I would not. I would not do that and retain any of the information. So it was very, very important. So these, those right there are the, are the six things. There's probably 20, but if I was going to give you six things that I've seen over the past three years that have been very, very successful when talking about we need to rebuild this application, those were the things right there that created the foundation, created the ability, enabled us to be able to do this successfully. All right, that's it. Uh, thank you guys so much. If anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer those. It looks like we've got like 14 minutes. Uh, so you got time for a nap still if you... <laughs> So that's, that's a great question. And at Envision, we're actually running to that exact same issue. I think we've got Angular 1.2. Yeah. Uh, I'm not an Angular guy. <laughs> if anybody wants to know about Angular, go talk to the, one of the Angular guys. Uh, so one of the things you could look at, and I believe, like he, he was talking about earlier, uh, Browserify and Webpack offer some great utilities. And they kind of give you the ability to wrap some of, those, some of the functionality. I, I don't know how it would work with 
with Angular, right? But if you're wanting to use, like, like for example, I can include React within the scope, within the context of this little module that I'm, that I'm adding, and then I can expose certain hooks, certain functionality that are just native, that are independent of the, the library. And then from the legacy app, I can hook into that and I can say, hey, you new module that was just built, I want you to render, here's where you're gonna be rendered, and you just do what you need to do, and on change, call, my, call this call back, on, on these events, you know, maybe hook up some event listeners or whatever. But I would look at something like using Browserify or, or Webpack. I'm a Browserify <laughs> fan. Yeah, but the, there's a lot of people that I think they do similar things, but I would look at that because that will allow you to run some things simultaneously. Yeah, so the new foundation is basically, well, so, cool. so kind of how we're talking right now. Like, um, a lot, uh, none of the projects were using Browserify, just to start with, none of them were using Browserify or, um, or Webpack or anything that like kind of modularized the code or kind of packaged the code up. It was just, okay, let's write the file and then in our HTML, let's include that file and you know, everything's like a big global object. So globals are not a good thing. It's, I mean, we, they're, they're not, uh, they have benefit, they have value, but they're not, it's not a good thing to have everything be a global value uh, or be globally available. So what, uh, what we would do is we would take, uh, we would we'd basically build an application, like a, a secondary application that just had one, it had one purpose. All it did was one thing, but it was bundled within Browserify we had all of our tests running using uh, Mocha, Karma, which those two run together. Um, you could do Jasmine or whatever. But we basically created a foundation that was, that was testable. And we basically said, every single piece of new code that's going to be written is going to be written with this library or with this, like, you know, we're using React and Backbone and some other things. So it's only going to be written with these libraries. It's only going to be inserted the way that we're going to insert all these new modules. And it, we're not going to continue to pollute the global scope. Right. Uh, I I have not found one actually that I haven't looked really hard. Um, oh yes, I'm. So, I thought you were asking for one. It's like I don't know. Um, yeah, you're basically just saying this is how we're going to write code from now on, and this is how tests are going to be written, and we require tests for these things. So it's basically whatever whatever fits. There's not real. I don't think there's like a it's not like a, it's an Angular thing or it's a React thing or Ember. It's more of a, here's how we are going to operate as a team. But understanding that that could change as time goes on, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions about how to get started um, implementing unit testing in combination with jQuery? <laughs> with jQuery. So jQuery has like JUnit or something like that. Um, I've never actually written tests with jQuery. By the time I started, writing tests, it, jQuery was more of a, like, using it to, to communicate with the, just using it for Ajax and not really DOM manipulation as much anymore, because I was leveraging other libraries to do that. So uh, I would look at how can, uh, look at JUnit um, and see, or I mean, I, I, the first thing I would do is I'd go home and Google testing with jQuery, right? But it, basically, if you can just come up with a way to, I'm gonna write my code in a way that I can, uh, call it, it doesn't depend on anything else around it. I can call that jQuery code and I can maybe define some mocks or, def, you know, I can kind of set up like a testing environment for it, like a dummy, a dummy environment. Because usually if you're dealing with jQuery, you're doing one or two things. You're talking to the server or you're manipulating the DOM, right? I don't know. Does anybody use it for anything else other than that? I think that's pretty much all you do with it. Kind of simple, actually. Um, so basically create a, a test environment and then have that code that you're writing be completely isolated to that. Like it only is gonna serve this one purpose and nothing else, it's not gonna be dependent on anything else. If it's dependent on the DOM, then that's gotta be part of your test too. So, yeah. And maybe look at seeing what you can do that does not use jQuery. See if there's other options out there. Maybe. Well, we're I mean, kind of moving towards Angular anyway. Yeah, and Angular has, Angular has Angular. testing stuff. Yeah. I'm just, I'm not personally, I can't talk much about Angular. I've only used it at Envision, and our implementation of it is not necessarily vanilla, so I'm having a hard time understanding it right now. <laughs> awesome. Any other, any other questions? Anybody else hot? Yes. Yes. Yes.
I probably contribute, like, I move a lot. So I'm probably <laughs> contributing to at least five degrees of that temperature. <laughs> awesome. Well, I will be here all day. Uh, you can reach me on any, so I don't do Snapchat. I'm too old for Snapchat. So uh, reach out to me however you'd like. Love to chat with you guys. If you have any questions, uh, I'll be around. So thank you.